Little House in the Big Woods by Laura Ingalls Wilder. The story takes place in 1871 and is about a young girl by the name of Laura Ingalls and her family who live in a house in the woods and about the challenges and the joys of pioneer life. And so, as always, my friend, settling comfortably under the covers, Take a full, comfortable breath. And as you exhale, relax and let go. Allow any tension to just melt away. Letting your body sink deeper and deeper down into the softness of your bed. There is nothing else to do and nowhere else to be. So just lay back, relax, and enjoy the story. Chapter 6 Two Big Bears Then one day, Pa said that spring was coming. In the big woods, the snow was beginning to thaw. Bits of it dropped from the branches of the trees and made little holes in the softening snow banks below. At noon, all the big icicles along the eaves of the little house quivered and sparkled in the sunshine, and drops of water hung trembling at their tips. Pa said he must go to town to trade the furs of the wild animals he had been trapping all winter. So one evening, he made a big bundle of them. There were so many furs that when they were packed tightly and tied together, they made a bundle almost as big as Pa. Very early one morning, Pa strapped the bundle of furs on his shoulders and started to walk to town. There were so many furs to carry that he could not take his gun. Ma was worried, but Pa said that by starting before sunup and walking very fast all day, he could get home again before dark. The nearest town was far away. Laura and Mary had never seen a town. They had never seen a store. They had never seen even two houses standing together. But they knew that in a town there were many houses, and a store full of candy and calico, and other wonderful things. They knew that Pa would trade his furs to the storekeeper for beautiful things from town, and all day they were expecting the presents he would bring them, when the sun sank low above the treetops, and no more drops fell from the tips of the icicles, they began to watch eagerly for Pa. The sun sank out of sight. The woods grew dark, and he did not come. Ma started supper and set the table, but he did not come. It was time to do the chores, and still he had not come. Ma said that Laura might come with her while she milked the cow. Laura could carry the lantern. So Laura put on her coat, and Ma buttoned it up and Laura put her hands into her red mittens that hung by a red yarn string around her neck, while Ma lighted the candle in the lantern. Laura was proud to be helping Ma with the milking, and she carried the lantern very carefully. Its sides were of tin, with places cut in them for the candlelight to shine through. When Laura walked behind Ma on the path to the barn, The little bits of candlelight from the lantern leaped all around her on the snow. The night was not quite dark. The woods were dark, but there was a gray light on the snowy path, and in the sky there were a few faint stars. The stars did not look as warm and bright as the lights that came from the lantern. 
Laura was surprised to see the dark shape of Suki, the brown cow, standing at the barnyard gate. Ma was surprised, too. It was too early in the spring for Suki to be let out in the big woods to eat grass. She lived in the barn. But sometimes on warm days, Pa left the door of her stall open so she could come into the barnyard. Now Ma and Laura saw her behind the bars, waiting for them. Ma went up to the gate and pushed against it to open it. But it did not open very far, because there was Suki standing against it, Ma said. Suki, get over. She reached across the gate and slapped Suki's shoulder. Just then, one of the dancing little bits of light from the lantern jumped between the bars of the gate, and Laura saw long, shaggy black fur and two little glittering eyes. Suki had thin, short brown fur. Suki had large, gentle eyes. Ma said, Laura, walk back to the house. So Laura turned around and began to walk toward the house. Ma came behind her. When they had gone part way, Ma snatched her up, lantern and all, and ran. Ma ran with her into the house and slammed the door. Then Laura said, Ma, was it a bear? Yes, Laura, Ma said, it was a bear. Laura began to cry. She hung on to Ma and sobbed. Oh, will he eat Suki? No, Ma said, hugging her. Suki is safe in the barn. Think, Laura, all those big, heavy logs in the barn walls, and the door is heavy and solid, made to keep bears out. No, the bear cannot get in and eat Suki. Laura felt better then. But he could have hurt us, couldn't he? she asked. He didn't hurt us, Ma said. You were a good girl, Laura, to do exactly as I told you, and to do it quickly without asking why. Ma was trembling, and she began to laugh a little. To think, she said, I've slapped a bear. Then she put supper on the table for Laura and Mary. Pa had not come yet. He didn't come. Laura and Mary were undressed, and they said their prayers and snuggled into the trundle bed. Ma sat by the lamp, mending one of Pa's shirts. The house seemed cold and still and strange without Pa. Laura listened to the wind in the big woods. All around the house the wind went crying as though it were lost in the dark and the cold. The wind sounded frightened. Ma finished mending the shirt. Laura saw her fold it slowly and carefully. She smoothed it with her hand. Then she did a thing she had never done before. She went to the door and pulled the leather latch string through its hole in the door so that nobody could get in from outside unless she lifted the latch. She came and took Carrie, all limp and sleeping, out of the big bed. She saw that Laura and Mary were still awake, and she said to them, Go to sleep, girls. Everything's all right. Pa will be here in the morning. Then she went back to her rocking chair and sat there rocking gently and holding baby Carrie in her arms. She was sitting up late, waiting for Pa, and Laura and Mary meant to stay awake too till he came, but at last they went to sleep. In the morning, Pa was there. He had brought candy for Laura and Mary and two pieces of pretty calico to make them each a dress. Mary's was a china blue pattern on a white ground, and Laura's was dark red with little golden brown dots on it. Ma had calico for a dress too. It was brown with a big feathery white pattern all over it. They were all happy because Pa had got such good prices for his furs that he could afford to get them such beautiful presents. The tracks of the big bear were all around the barn, and there were marks of his claws on the walls, but Suki and the horses were safe inside. 
All that day the sun shone, the snow melted, and little streams of water ran from the icicles, which all the time grew thinner. Before the sun set that night, the bear tracks were only shapeless marks in the wet soft snow. After supper, Pa took Laura and Mary on his knees and said he had a new story to tell them. When I went to town yesterday with the furs, I found it hard walking in the soft snow. It took me a long time to get to town, and other men with furs had come in earlier to do their trading. The storekeeper was busy, and I had to wait until he could look at my furs. Then we had to bargain about the price of each one, and then I had to pick out the things I wanted to take in trade. So it was nearly sundown before I could start home. I tried to hurry, but the walking was hard and I was tired, so I had not gone far before night came, and I was alone in the big woods without my gun. There were still six miles to walk, and I came along as fast as I could. The night grew darker and darker, and I wished for my gun, because I knew that some of the bears had come out of their winter dens. I had seen their tracks when I went to town in the morning. Bears are hungry and cross at this time of year. You know, they have been sleeping in their dens all winter long with nothing to eat, and that makes them thin and angry when they wake up. I did not want to meet one. I hurried along as quick as I could in the dark. By and by, the stars gave a little light. It was still black as pitch where the woods were thick, but in the open places, I could see dimly. I could see the snowy road ahead a little way, and I could see the dark woods standing all around me. I was glad when I came into an open place where the stars gave me this faint light. All the time I was watching, as well as I could, for bears. I was listening for the sounds they make when they go carelessly through the bushes. Then I came again into an open place, and there, right in the middle of my road, I saw a big black bear. He was standing up on his hind legs, looking at me. I could see his eyes shine. I could see his big snout. I could even see one of his claws in the starlight. My scalp prickled, and my hair stood straight up. I stopped in my tracks and stood still. The bear did not move. There he stood, looking at me. I knew it would do no good to try to go around him. He would follow me into the dark woods, where he could see better than I could. I did not want to fight a winter-starved bear in the dark. Oh, how I wished for my gun. I had to pass that bear to get home. I thought that if I could scare him, he might get out of the road and let me go by. So I took a deep breath, and suddenly I shouted with all my might and ran at him, waving my arms. He didn't move. I did not run very far toward him, I tell you. I stopped and looked at him, and he stood looking at me. Then I shouted again. There he stood. I kept on shouting and waving my arms, but he did not budge. Well, it would do me no good to run away. There were other bears in the woods. I might as well deal with this one as with another. Besides, I was coming home to Ma and you girls. I would never get here if I ran away from everything in the woods that scared me. So at last I looked around, and I got a good big club, a solid, heavy branch that had been broken from a tree by the weight of snow in the winter. I lifted it up in my hands, and I ran straight at the bear. I swung my club as hard as I could and brought it down, bang, on his head. And there he still stood, for he was nothing but a big, black, burned stump. I had passed it on my way to town that morning. It wasn't a bear at all. 
I only thought it was a bear, because I had been thinking all the time about bears and being afraid I'd meet one. It really wasn't a bear at all, Mary asked. No, Mary, it wasn't a bear at all. There I had been yelling and dancing and waving my arms, all by myself in the big woods, trying to scare a stump. Laura said, Ours was a real bear, but we were not scared because we thought it was Suki. Pa did not say anything, but he hugged her tighter. Oh, that bear might have eaten Ma and me all up, Laura said, snuggling closer to him. But Ma walked right up to him and slapped him, and he didn't do anything at all. Why didn't he do anything? I guess he was too surprised to do anything, Laura, Pa said. I guess he was afraid when the lantern shone in his eyes. And when Ma walked up to him and slapped him, he knew she wasn't afraid. Well, you were brave too, Laura said. Even if it was only a stump, you thought it was a bear. You'd have hit him on the head with a club if he had been a bear, wouldn't you, Pa? Yes, said Pa, I would. You see, I had to. Then Ma said it was bedtime. She helped Laura and Mary undress and button up their red flannel nightgowns. They knelt down by the trundle bed and said their prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Ma kissed them both and tucked the covers in around them. They lay there a while, looking at Ma's smooth, parted hair and her hands, busy with sewing in the lamplight. Laura looked at Pa, who was greasing his boots. His mustaches and his hair and his long brown beard were silky in the lamplight, and the colors of his plaid jacket were gay. He whistled cheerfully while he worked. It was a warm night. The fire had gone to coals in the hearth, and Pa did not build it up. All around the little house in the big woods, there were little sounds of falling snow, and from the eaves there was the drip, drip of the melting icicles. In just a little while, the trees would be putting out their baby leaves, all rosy and yellow and pale green, and there would be wild flowers and birds in the woods. Then there would be no more stories by the fire at night. But all day long, Laura and Mary would run and play among the trees, for it would be spring. Chapter 7 The Sugar Snow For days, the sun shone and the weather was warm. There was no frost on the windows in the mornings. All day, the icicles fell one by one from the eaves with soft, smashing and crackling sounds in the snowbanks beneath. The trees shook their wet, black branches and chunks of snow fell down. When Mary and Laura pressed their noses against the cold window pane, they could see the drip of water from the eaves and the bare branches of the trees. The snow did not glitter. It looked soft and tired. Under the trees, it was pitted where the chunks of snow had fallen, and the banks beside the path were shrinking and settling. Then one day, Laura saw a patch of bare ground in the yard. All day, it grew bigger, and before night, the whole yard was bare mud. Only the icy path was left and the snow banks along the path, and the fence, and beside the woodpile. Can't I go out to play, Ma? Laura asked. And Ma said, May, Laura. May I go out to play? She asked. You may tomorrow, Ma promised. That night, Laura woke up shivering. The bed covers felt thin, and her nose was icy cold. Ma was tucking another quilt over her. Snuggle close to Mary, Ma said, 
and you'll get warm. In the morning, the house was warm from the stove. But when Laura looked out of the window, she saw that the ground was covered with soft, thick snow. All along the branches of the trees, the snow was piled like feathers, and it lay in mounds along the top of the rail fence and stood up in great white balls on top of the gate posts. Pa came in, shaking the soft snow from his shoulders and stamping it from his boots. It's a sugar snow, he said. Laura put her tongue quickly to a little bit of white snow that lay in a fold of his sleeve. It was nothing but wet on her tongue, like any snow. She was glad that nobody had seen her taste it. Why is it a sugar snow, Pa? she asked him. But he said he didn't have time to explain now. He must hurry away. He was going to Grandpa's. Grandpa lived far away in the big woods, where the trees were closer together and larger. Laura stood at the window and watched Pa, big and swift and strong, walking away over the snow. His gun was on his shoulder, his hatchet and powder horn hung at his side, and his tall boots made great tracks in the soft snow. Laura watched him till he was out of sight in the woods. It was late before he came home that night. Ma had already lighted the lamp when he came in. Under one arm, he carried a large package, and in the other hand was a big, covered wooden bucket. Here, Caroline, he said, handing the package and the bucket to Ma, and then he put the gun on its hooks over the door. Ma unwrapped the package, and there were two hard brown cakes, each as large as a milk pan. She uncovered the bucket, and it was full of dark brown syrup. Here, Laura and Mary, Pa said, and he gave them each a little round package out of his pocket. They took off the paper wrappings, and each had a little hard brown cake with beautifully crinkled edges. Bite it, said Pa, and his blue eyes twinkled. Each bit off one little crinkle, and it was sweet. It crumbled in their mouths. It was better even than their Christmas candy. Maple sugar, said Pa. Supper was ready, and Laura and Mary laid the little maple sugar cakes beside their plates while they ate the maple syrup on their bread. After supper, Pa took them on his knees, and he sat before the fire and told them about his day at Grandpa's and the sugar snow. All winter, Pa said, Grandpa has been making wooden buckets and little troughs. He made them of cedar and white ash, for those woods won't give a bad taste to the maple syrup. To make the troughs, he split out little sticks as long as my hand and as big as my two fingers. Near one end, Grandpa cut the stick half through and split one half off. This left him a flat stick with a square piece at one end. Then with a bit, he bored a hole lengthwise through the square part, and with his knife, he whittled the wood till it was only a thin shell around the round hole. The flat part of the stick he hollowed out with his knife till it was a little trough. He made dozens of them, and he made ten new wooden buckets. He had them all ready when the first warm weather came and the sap began to move in the trees. Then he went into the maple woods, and with the bit he bored a hole in each maple tree, and he hammered the round end of the little trough into the hole, and he set a cedar bucket on the ground under the flat end. The sap, you know, is the blood of the tree. It comes up from the roots when warm weather begins in the spring, and it goes to the very tip of each branch and twig to make the green leaves grow. Well, when the maple sap came to the hole in the tree, it ran out of the tree, down the little trough, and into the bucket. 
Oh, didn't it hurt the poor tree? Laura asked. No more than it hurts you when you prick your finger and it bleeds, said Pa. Every day, Grandpa puts on his boots and his warm coat and his fur cap, and he goes out into the snowy woods and gathers the sap. With a barrel on a sled, he drives from tree to tree and empties the sap from the buckets into the barrel. Then he hauls it to a big iron kettle that hangs by a chain from a cross timber between two trees. He empties the sap into the iron kettle. There's a big bonfire under the kettle and the sap boils and Grandpa watches it carefully. The fire must be hot enough to keep the sap boiling, but not hot enough to make it boil over. Every few minutes, the sap must be skimmed. Grandpa skims it with a big, long-handled wooden ladle that he made of basswood. When the sap gets too hot, Grandpa lifts ladlefuls of it high in the air and pours it back slowly. This cools the sap a little and keeps it from boiling too fast. When the sap has boiled down just enough, he fills the buckets with the syrup. After that, he boils the sap until it grains when he cools it in a saucer. The instant the sap is graining, Grandpa jumps to the fire and rakes it all out from beneath the kettle. Then as fast as he can, he ladles the thick syrup into the milk pans that are standing ready. In the pans, the syrup turns to cakes of hard brown maple sugar. So that's why it's a sugar snow? Because Grandpa is making sugar? Laura asked. No, Pa said. It's called a sugar snow because a snow this time of year means that men can make more sugar. You see, this little cold spell and the snow will hold back the leafing of the trees, and that makes a longer run of sap. When there's a long run of sap, it means that Grandpa can make enough maple sugar to last all the year for common every day. When he takes his furs to town, he will not need to trade for much store sugar. He will get only a little store sugar to have on the table when company comes. Grandpa must be glad there's a sugar snow, Laura said. Yes, Pa said. He's very glad. He's going to sugar off again next Monday, and he says we must all come. Pa's blue eyes twinkled. He had been saving the best for last, and he said to Ma, Hey, Caroline, there'll be a dance. Ma smiled. She looked very happy, and she lay down her mending for a minute. Oh, Charles, she said. Then she went on with her mending, but she kept on smiling. She said, I'll wear my Delaine. Ma's Delaine dress was beautiful. It was a dark green with a little pattern all over it that looked like ripe strawberries. A dressmaker had made it in the east, in the place where Ma came from when she married Pa and moved out west to the big woods in Wisconsin. Ma had been very fashionable before she married Pa, and a dressmaker had made her clothes. The Delane was kept wrapped in paper and laid away. Laura and Mary had never seen Ma wear it, but she had shown it to them once. She had let them touch the beautiful dark red buttons and she had shown them how neatly the whale bones were put in the seams inside with hundreds of little crisscross stitches. It showed how important a dance was if Ma was going to wear the beautiful Delaine dress. Laura and Mary were excited. They bounced up and down on Pa's knees and asked questions about the dance until at last he said, Now you girls run along to bed. You'll know all about the dance when you see it. I have to put a new string on my fiddle. There were sticky fingers and sweet mouths to be washed. Then there were prayers to be said. 
by the time Laura and Mary were snug in their trundle bed. Pa and the fiddle were both singing while he kept time with his foot on the floor. Sweet dreams, my friend. Sleep well. <laughs>